All right, so having the conversation. So I'll give you, so when I started seeing patients in the emergency department, because my original training was in emergency medicine, um, I thought about fighting the good fight, and I was the doctor who said no, right? So I was the one who wasn't handing out opioids and uh, wasn't doing that, and I thought because um, I was doing the right thing that that's why some of the patients would get mad at me, and it was because my colleagues were continued to write it, and so I would say no, and uh, then they would leave the ER, and then they would check back in like 30 minutes later to hope to get to see another doctor, and many times they would, and then that doctor... Uh, Dr. Hammersmith, um, the hammer as we called him, had been working in the emergency department for 4,500 years, and he would always write them for what they wanted. They always wanted to see uh, uh, Dr. Hammersmith. So, uh, and, and with that, I got more complaints than any other physician in the emergency department. And it wasn't just our emergency department. We were a part of this collaborative effort nationally to collect patient complaints. And so we had 70 other emergency departments in the country connected to this, and I was number one. <laughs> and, and what I wanted to do from that was, was say, that's because I'm doing a good job. It actually wasn't. It's because I was an a-hole. And, <laughs> and, and so as we start to think about what that really means is, even if you do the right thing, but you do it improperly, that doesn't get you the result that you want because they did turn around and come right back and they ultimately got what they wanted and they didn't get help. What they got was somebody who basically just said no because no is what I wanna say. And that conversation went something like this. Hi, I'm Dr. Waller. I see uh, as I was looking at your chart that you've been in the emergency department a lot. And so let's just start with, I'm not gonna give you any dope. And, and, and so tell me what's going on. And that was how I would start the conversation. And that was before I learned um, about trauma-informed care. That was before I learned that people have actual feelings and uh, <laughs> you know, all the stuff they, they forget to tell you in medical school. And I, I was in, in graduate school for neuromolecular biology before, so you think something you know, even less connected to people than, than being a doctor, it's that you know, in a lab doing little things with pipettes and, and, and that. So in the end, having the conversation had been really a journey for me to learn. And only after um, I created a clinic specifically for patients in the ER 10 or more times per year and got board certified in addiction and, um, and then started working with a, a cadre of master's level uh, social workers did I actually learn how to have the conversation. And this is not really taught in medical school in general. And so when we start to look at this, we, we talk about motivational interviewing, and motivational interviewing is a little bit of you can do it, right? It's a little bit of Tony Robbins. It's a, it's a little bit of, oh my God, it's so amazing that you only missed five of your last visits instead of six. That's a great job. You know, that, that's a part of it, but it, there's actually some science behind how you have a conversation with someone to elicit the change that they know they ultimately need and ultimately want, but are having a hard time pushing through that and having somebody re-traumatizing re them from their early life or continually beating them down with guilt or being angry at them is not the best way to do that. So we look at things like eliciting change talk, the, these basic pathways of this, right? The basic thing is, so you know, you're in my office and we're gonna do a couple of case studies um, at the end, so you're gonna get to see, I'm coming all the way from New Jersey to act in California. On the, on the stage, so that would be super funny since the only actor from Jersey that I know of is the situation. So it could be <laughs> tough. So as we look here, basic questions, asking, not telling, of, so how would, it, how would your life, the miracle question is what I always talk about with the patient. So if I ask you in the middle, of, uh, it, you had the miracle that everything you wanted happened. You had no pain, you had everything that you, you know, you're asking me to give you in a little pill bottle, how would you know? How would you, when you woke up the next morning, how would you know? And how would it be different? And then have them start to work through that with you and then talking about, well, what if we just took one less pill a day? Would that be, you know, would that be a horrible thing? What is your biggest fear with that? And just walk through that. You don't tell them you're gonna have them take one less pill a day on the first visit. That's a hard conversation to have and they generally won't have a second visit. When you walk in and go, look, I see you're on a whole bunch of drugs, so we're going to get you off those. Well, they're probably not going to come back. They're going to go find somebody else to write those. And as we look through this, 
if you, if you don't change, you know, what is the, the worst thing that might happen? I mean, we, we've just seen statistics that show what happens, what the worst thing is, and we see that happen way beyond, you know, currently other diseases. I mean, we talk about the things that are most fatal, and we talk about, like, cancer. Uh, what is the number one cause of cancer in the United States? Yeah, what is that? It's an addiction. Interesting. And yet we're talking about another one that we have that we still haven't set up the system to treat the biggest cause of death from, you know, from all cause medical conditions, smoking. And we have another one that's happening you know, to work on patients that are 18 and 19 and 20 and pregnant. And ha the number of life years lost to this disease, the opioid uh, crisis, is completely different than the number of life years lost for someone with lung cancer, which generally happens much later in life as compared to here. So if you look at life years lost, it eclipses almost every other disease that we have. So having these conversations, getting them to elicit those answers um, is a little easier now because there's a lot of stuff that sits out in, in the news that allows us to do that. We can use techniques like normalizing and decisional balancing. You know, this one's really helpful. So when I, all, the vast majority of patients that I see have already been told they need to get off of medications and are refractory to that, and they're coming to me to get kind of that last opinion. You know, it's like the, all right, this is the doctor who's gonna say that it's okay for me to be on opioids. And sometimes we do, but we change the way that they're delivered and we evaluate the patient. But the vast majority of the time, we have to have the conversation of, we need to figure out how to either get you off or onto a different version or down to a lower dose or onto you know, another medication. And that's a hard conversation, but when you can, when you can tell them, you know, look, I, I've had hundreds of patients have to have this emotion that you're having right now, and for everybody, it's an individual thing. Because I don't wake up in your shoes, and you know, I, don't, I don't know what you feel or what you think, and I, and I never will. But just know that there are a lot of other people who feel like they are suffering you know, with this problem. So that they don't feel alone, because most of these patients will absolutely feel alone, and being able to let them know that it's a normal thing to fear change. It's a normal thing to fear getting off of a medication that you've become so connected to, and if it's to the point of addiction, then that comes to a pathological sense where you lose the logical capability to even understand that. But even patients with chronic pain without addiction they feel like when they slow, the, they decrease the pain meds or they stop it, and most of them have tried on their own, and they've done it in such a way that they go into withdrawal and they think that withdrawal is what they're gonna feel like forever if they uh, don't take these pain medications. And, and so just letting them know that this is a normal fear that people have is really important. When we look at, um, this, is, this one's my favorite. So he was way off TV before I really watched TV, but at the same time, um, the Colombo approach, everybody know who Colombo is? You know, Peter Falk. And um, so he would always come kind of at the end of the show, you know, is like he always had the bad guy in front of him who feels like they're about to get away with something and he's about to leave the room and then he would turn around and he'd be like, you know, on one hand, you're telling me this, but on the other hand, this is what we're seeing. And you fact, 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 fact. And what you've done is you've taken what's, what they're saying they want to do or what they've done, and then you're showing all of the facts that show that that's not actually happening. And in real life, what that looks like is a patient who says, I just want to go back to school, but I can't. And, and you say, well, is that because you don't have enough opioids, or is it because you haven't actually filled out any applications to school? <laughs> you know, you said you wanted to do this like in the last five visits, but I don't see any effort to do that and yet you're just telling me that it's more meds, more meds that are gonna do it, but we both know that more meds aren't gonna make you fill out an application. So having that ability to just go back at them. Affirmations and feedback um, seem quirky, but are very real and very helpful in the way that you can deliver those uh, to patients. And um, it also is a, a quick way uh, to get them talking without you having to tell them what they're gonna talk about and asking permission to have that conversation. We forget to do that a lot in, in medicine. We forget to ask permission of the patient, is it okay to talk about these things? Because we have a screening test that we need to just check the boxes and come up with a score and determine which pathway they go down. And so just asking, you know, do you, what do you know about the, the, the effects of smoking? And then you'll, they'll tell you the things that are on the Surgeon General package. I'm like, and then you can get in with the, did you know that it also decreases effectiveness of your pain meds? 
And so you can actually get a 25% bump in your pain meds just by stopping smoking. And they're like, what? And, and so you're asking me to increase your pain meds, which I don't think is good because you can give yourself a 25% bump and, and you can start to have those conversations where before, if you just say, you need to stop smoking because it's bad for your pain, it doesn't really work. Uh, these are common traps uh, that people fall into when you're, when you're talking to a patient. Uh, very commonly, we'll have this uh, question answer trap, which is um, you'll ask a series of questions that you're really just looking for yes, no answers. And this is the hallmark of, of training actually in emergency medicine because the average bedside time when I was working in the emergency department versus the clinic was three minutes. And so when you have three minutes to determine sick, not sick, if sick, inpatient sick, or go home sick. I mean, and that's, the, that's the, the pathway. And you're all, in an emergency medicine doctor, we're trained to expect people to spontaneously combust. That we think worst case scenario, like, what's gonna happen? They said chest pain. Well, they're gonna explode. I mean, it's just, it's just gonna happen. I mean, it's just gonna, it, there's a bomb and it's gonna go off inside their chest. I mean, that's what's gonna happen. And so you're, you're trained to think through all of these things that are rare, but, but happen. And we don't tolerate in the emergency department a one in 1,000 uh, chance of death without testing. So if I, if I think you have one in 1,000 chance of having a, um, a dissecting aorta, I'm gonna scan your chest. Oh, and by the way, if I squirt you with a little dye, we can look at your, uh, we can rule out a pulmonary embolus, we can rule out you know, your uh, dissecting aorta, and I can uh, rule out you know, anything going on with your coronary artery disease because the pictures are so good now. It's called the triple rule out. It's the ER doctor's best friend. Now, the people leave the emergency department glowing from radiation, but at the same time, we, I can sleep at night. So that's, you know, what I get. But what we don't do is, uh, is ask open-ended questions. We're very much, how long, did it, um, how long have you had this? What did it do? What did you take? How did you take it? I mean, it's just very close. There's no open-ended question of, how did you get here? Like, to this point where you overdosed and you had to get, you know, somebody give you naloxone in a Burger King bathroom. Like, how did that happen? And then listening. One, because you don't have time, but two, because we're not really trained in how to, how to elicit that and then how to respond to it in a very good way. The uh, confrontation denial trap. Yeah, don't, don't even start to try to tell me that you're not here to get drugs. Well, not a lot of conversation is going to happen with that one. But that type of stuff happens all the time. And I've actually heard some really horrible things come out of my colleagues' mouths because I've had patients who go to the ER um, and they would, they would call me and leave their phone on and put it in their pocket. And so I could hear friends of mine uh, close the curtain and behave like the meanest person I've ever met. And the, the th words that I've heard come out of my colleagues' mouths um, to people who have been massively traumatized, either with sexual trauma, physical trauma, emotional trauma, neglect in their early lives all the way through. And then what are we doing in the one place that they think that they can be safe? re-traumatizing them over and over again. And so now, every time that they walk into a medical facility, it elicits a trauma response, which changes the behavior that they have, which makes it really hard for us to have any conversation because now they've heightened into this fight or flight pathway, and you can't even start some of these conversations just because of what we've done to them over time. And so reapproaching this and having these conversations becomes this blaming trap. We do this all the time especially with my pregnant patients when I would see them, uh, they would get blamed for hurting their baby and like all of these things. I mean, just really mean things that, and we wonder why they don't show back up for prenatal care, right? You know, so these are, these are ways in which we can have a, a good conversation, elicit information rather than telling someone. And then once we get that information, we can help them make a decision, right? We help them make a decision. We can't make the decision for them because that's not the decision they're going to follow. You really have to bring them um, along with you and, in fact, many times have them lead. You have to be aware of what you look like and they look like and just address that because they're going to assume, especially nowadays with heightened concerns about race or relations and interactions, that if you look like me, that I'm not going to be able to have a conversation with someone who doesn't look like me. And just put it out there. Just say it. I don't know what it's like to, to be in your shoes. I really don't. And do you, do you think that you get worse care because um, you're African American? And they say, well, they, and they won't answer yes. They never have. And I've asked that question 500 times. Well, no. Well, yes, you do. And I have data to show it. I'm aware of that. And if you ever feel it, you have to let me know that. 
So it's important as you create these relationships that you realize that the only thing that's actually gonna make a difference in eliciting information and treating a patient is what we call an authentic healing relationship. And that is the point at which you can start to apply all of the science, data, and math that's out there about dosing, about how you wean somebody down, about the pathophysiology, about all the mu receptors and why, ever, since everybody has the same mu receptors, why is it that different people have addiction? You know, some people get it, some people don't. Well, you know what, some people had early life trauma, some people didn't. Some people have, you know, no structure around them and no housing and no, no transportation and that, and then they've been beaten their entire, entire early lives and then all of a sudden they take one medicine that made that go away. So it's not just a matter sometimes of telling somebody we're gonna get you off of a medication because it's bad. You're also telling them I'm gonna take away the only thing that's ever abated your suffering. That is a heavy lift when you think about it. So don't take it lightly as we try to aggressively move toward less opioids, less benzodiazepines, and move those to a point where we'll get there, but you have to realize that the patient is the center of that and the conversation that you have means as much or more than any of the science that you know. And as a physician who ultimately has now been backwards trained by his social work staff, you know, to do this you know, appropriately, it is important to understand that these are all the things that lead to this trap, is if you don't learn it, then we walk in and fall into this trap every time. I'm the expert, listen to what I say. What happened with that? 19,700 deaths a year is happening with that. We saw those curves, and as the expert, we have managed to kill a lot of people. So we should not be starting with that one at any time soon. The rest of these, I mean, it's just over and over, we've identified the bad things to do and the good things to do. There's plenty of uh, these things to look at, but the biggest one is a ton of different ways Motivational interviewing and trauma-informed care come down to one basic thing. It's about them, not you, and be nice. That's it. I mean, if you're just nice and you make the focus the patient and not about the visit, not about the med, not about the diagnosis, and about where they are in life and what they have to deal with on a regular basis, that's where you can actually start this authentic healing relationship with the patient and they will push you faster than you could have pushed them once you've, once you've made that connection.